All right. Well, welcome everybody. Tom Miller here to our final edition uh, of the 10 Indicators for High Performance Charter Schools book study. And there she is. There's my teammate, Lauren Waters, uh, coming in right, right as we kick off here. Lauren, hope you're doing well today on this Monday. I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I am. Uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the terminology. Spring break is all around me. Uh, there's <laughs> our, our school is right in the middle of of this uh, spring break, like Haven. And there's like footballs flying against the side of a building and there's people <laughs> going by. It is it is pure bedlam, but it's awesome. Right? Everybody's having a good time here in uh, Seaside, Santa Rosa Beach, uh, Florida. So uh, I'm excited to get this uh, this fifth and final session of this uh, book uh, conversation uh, uh, because there's some really great uh, content in these two particular chapters that are really focused on uh, people and uh, they're not employees, right? And that's maybe the hardest part about this at all when we talk about uh, parent partnerships and, and uh, board members. But I uh, wanted just to kind of just, you know, remind everybody, maybe this is the first time that you're listening to our replay. Uh, maybe, you know, you're either on the podcast or or maybe you're part of the, um, uh, of our YouTube page, right? You can watch these um, anywhere. But, but you know, one of the keys that I really just, you know, thought about is this, this book is not meant to be, it's not a consumable. I mean, it is a consumable in terms of, it's a workbook in a sense, it's a thinking partner, it's a it's a strategizing tool for you to use uh, as a principal or a coach or a superintendent or whatever role you might be in upper level administration, even board member. Um, and it's really built to help you think, right? So the 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 stories, the uh, strategies, uh, you you know, the ideas are great in the book, and you could definitely follow them. And and you know fail forward and and do better and so even if your school is really you know pretty strong it could take it to the next level or what I would recommend is as as you're reading it I want you to talk to the book through your pen right I want you to to write down what's what's coming through you in terms of your school and your thoughts because that's really what's going to create um, growth is the action steps that you know you need to take to move from here to there. So um, so the first you know part of the book is it's a reality check. It's a help you understand what's our current reality of of, of our school situation. Uh, but then it's also going to help you cast vision for what higher performance would look like for your school. All right. And and so you got to start from where you are. You have to grow from that from that, you know, departure point before you can even think about that. Um, and it's kind of like if you think about it from like a classroom, Lauren, you and I were both classroom teachers. And it's like, you know, you sometimes you expect a student to get to that next level, but you haven't built the rungs of the ladder. Right? You know, there's not a there's not a strong foundation under them or even trying to get a teacher to to move, you know, the needle in the classroom, but they're just maybe brand new or they don't have the experience or they've never, you know, you have to start from where you are, right? So you grow from that point. Um, you always keep the high level of, of, of success in your image because that's what you want to get to, uh, but you're not going to get there overnight. It's going to take time. So it's a current reality, you know, you know, evaluation tool. It's a vision casting tool. And then the third part is it's a strategy tool. It's, it's you know designed to help you put um, uh, skinny strategic plans you know together, small steps, small action steps, to be able to move your school from here to there to get to that next level. Um, so welcome if this is your first uh, session, or if if it's it's the fifth session. Uh, hopefully something I said there just kind of jarred a little bit. Oh, that's how I use uh, this book. Because if you just try to read this book, you're gonna just it's a lot. It's 330 pages, a lot of information. <laughs> These two chapters in particular are massive in terms of, um, you know, like the sub indicators and all the different things that you can do, uh, you know, within there. So, I, so I don't want you to try to read it. Just, just don't read it. It's a, it's a tool. Tom, I was going to add just one, one more thing that I think the book is, is it's a reflecting tool. Mm -hmm. You know, as I'm reading it, and hearing the stories that you share throughout it and the strategies that you share without it, throughout it, um, you know, I'm reflecting constantly on my own personal experiences at my school, um, my former school, and then 
you know, personal experience that I've gone through now working with you and <laughs> um, it's making me, yes, yes. Or, or what about this? You know, right. so I'm having all these reflections yeah. going on um, as I read the book. Good. Well, that's, that's what it's meant, you know, to be, I like the, what about this, right. Or what if we went mm -hmm. here? Um, yeah. And, and also I, I, I wrote it this way uh, because I wanted people to know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Leading a school is hard <laughs> and you're going to, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to uh, make decisions that you believe are the best decision with the best information you have. And it's not always going to work out. It's not always going to work out and that's okay. You just basically found a way not to do it. <laughs> right. So you have to kind of pull out, well, what maybe did work. All uh, right. And it's, I, I use this kind of analogy all the time. When I talk about this book, we all have, you know, I, there's not too many people in the world who don't have a smartphone anymore, but you know, every smartphone has a GPS. And as long as you have uh, data and service, you can, you can create a map from here to there and if you make a wrong turn, your GPS is going to make an adjustment for you. And so if you are measuring your, your, your school regularly, and I would say maybe every quarter at the, at, the, at the minimum having these conversations around your wheel and reassessing, but every single week you should be having conversations about you know, how, what, what action steps did we take to move to the next level. And it's going to help you redirect and course uh, correct to get to that, um, that better result. So, yeah. So another book, Lauren, that I'm reading, um, that John Maxwell just well, he hasn't. It has. It's not live to everybody yet, but it's 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 called High Road Leadership, and I know you got to hear John talk mm -hmm. on this last year, and um, it really just got me thinking about everything that you need to be and as a leader of a high performing school is also in this book too. So I'm excited for us to have this uh, resource and to be able to share some of it, um, you know, with you all. I'll share a little bit of, of my notes, uh, you know, you know, before we start about, you know, uh, parents, because I think this is really important. I wrote down to design a high performing school, you need to be a combination of good values and great skills. And we talked about, you know, values are part of the, um, you know, indicator one with your mission and your vision and, and your culture as well. Because remember, indicator five was all about culture and culture is the behavior of the people and the actions. And we think about parent partnerships and board, it's all human behavior, right? I mean, it's really set around that. So uh, if if either your values aren't very strong, which mine weren't when I was a younger leader, uh, and my skills weren't great either, right? So if you're lacking one or both, um, it's going to create a deficit for your school significantly. And it's going to, you're the leadership lid. If you've read John Maxwell's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, like that's the first law. You're the lid. If, you're, if your values aren't there and your skills are, uh, you know, subpar, even if your skills are great, if your values are poor, you're not going to get the best results because no one's going to want to work with you. Sorry to say it, everybody, <laughs> but they're not. <laughs> they may work there and avoid you as best as possible. So it's so it's so important uh, to build a team of like-minded leaders, right? Like-minded in terms of values and vision, but think differently and have you know different experiences and different perspectives and the high performing schools that I'm around, not everybody agrees, right? It's good. They have healthy conflict and they have really good, strong, heated conversations about what's best for kids. Um, and that's what you want in this, in this uh, circumstance. Um, so those that, you know, in those round tables, your own round tables, when you all got your wheel of success out or you all got your scores out and you're having conversations around higher, what higher levels of, of uh, performance would be, um, like, you know, who do we need to be or grow into, or maybe who should, you know, be uh, 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 responsible for it. You have to be okay with disagreement. High level leaders are okay with disagreement. Uh, it's important uh, that they, that they become okay with it because you're going to lose the best thinking of everybody around the table if you're not willing to listen to them. 
right? I mean, because eventually when you surround yourself or when you don't listen to the people around you, they're not going to have anything to say. <laughs> they're just going to come to work, do their job and right, just give minimal effort. They're not going to be giving, uh, you know, their best. And so it's really hard to listen when you think you know it all. And that's basically, if you were around me in the years 2000 and good gravy, 2001 to probably 2010, like that's who I was. I thought I knew it all. And uh, as John Wooden said, it's what you learn after you think you know it all that really counts. So luckily the last 14 years have been better. <laughs> They've been better. They've been better. So um, communication, collaboration, right? All those keys, um, they're always going to lead to better answers and better results than isolation. Uh, so don't lead isolated. Uh, I just love it, Lauren. I was just looking at some people that have taken a 10 indicators assessment and just reaching out and checking in on them. And there's this one school where I noticed the principal took it and the multiple teachers. So a shout out to you, Susan, if you're listening. But I just love it. I mean, because if you don't, you maybe you don't, maybe your school is so small, you don't really have an admin team, which is okay. Um, yeah, so grab some teacher leaders and, and get their uh, uh, perspective and get your wheels on a table and start having those conversations. So, um, and then the fastest is the last thing, Lauren, I promise. The fastest and the most proven way to bring people together is, is to find common ground. So this book, um, and, and, you know, you and I got some time with my mentor, Paul, right? He was talking about common ground and it creates common language and common language is culture. And that's the fastest way to create better results is, is to find that common ground, to find that common, common enemy almost in our school, whatever it may be, uh, that we can all rally against to, to move our school to the next level. And I think no other group of stakeholders is more important to do this than your parents, right? I mean, I think about when uh, a few years ago, I, I told the story in the book, uh, how, you know, a school that I was put as the interim uh, director, uh, let go of their principal on a Friday, I was there on Monday, and the teachers went on strike. And over the next 30 days, like 40% of them left. And the really only recruitment tool we had, because Google was just filled with all the negative press about our school and YouTube videos, because the, because the news came, the only recruitment tool we had was our parent base. And oh my gosh, it was so important uh, to be able to um, you know, rally them and for them to start to be our vision casters and carriers in the community to let everybody know that this isn't like what you see on Google isn't real. And then a lot of them came to actually work. You know, they started as substitutes, but then they, you know, some were stay-at-home moms that were former teachers. And, and so we were able to get them back into the classroom and do some training. But I mean, they, they really, in my opinion, saved the school because they believed in something bigger. Uh, right. And they and they were the ones that made everybody else. There's no way I could stand up there and tell them, everybody, it's fine. Right. I needed people in the building outside of the building. Right. To say it was OK, uh, because your teachers and your and your staff are going to be those really key um, uh, communicators outside of the walls of your building. And I just think that's so, so important for a leader to put their ego aside and to take the time to um, really get engaged in the community, um, in the parent base first, right? And then outside of that, you know, parent base, you have strategic partners and community partners, and some schools are partners with colleges and businesses, and then you get internships. There's just so many things you could do with this uh, parent level of engagement. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts, Lauren, because your school was really good. Yeah. I feel it, um, you know, getting our parents involved. Um, I was just going to piggyback off the story that you just shared, because that was some of the notes that I wrote down was, um, you know, your your parents are your biggest advocate advocates. And I think that's why it's so important to build those relationships with them and to build trust so that when you have those moments of crisis or 
um, whether, you know, as big as the one you described in the book uh, there on page 174, or even maybe ones that are not so big. Um, but when you have those relationships and trust, you don't feel like you have to hide it from them because they know your intentions. They know who you are um, as a school, as an organization. And, and then you can lean into them to support you through those difficult times and use them as your ally and resource. Yeah. And I think you hit, you know, nail on the head. Communication is so important because you have to remember this, everybody, non-communication is still communication. And so mm-hmm. having a good cadence and a flow of your communication, which I talk about in, um, you know, one of the sections of the book, you got to have something consistent, Right. And whether it's, you know, if you're the head of the organization or maybe you have some building level principles, uh, something's got to be coming out and informing everybody. And then you have to be thinking about all the other stuff. Right. So I feel like I spend the majority of my day wondering um, what do parents need to know? Right. What do my staff need to know? Obviously, first, because there's nothing that drives the staff crazy more than parents finding out before them. Write that down, everybody. They hate it. (laughs) So, and a lot of them are parents and that's what happens. You like shoot a message out to the parents and then, and then the teachers get the message because they're also a parent and then they're like, what's this? I don't understand. Right. Um, But so the, so I, so I, you know, start the chapter, you know, talking about defining partnership and defining engagement. And I don't recall engagement being an important word for me when it came to parents until Lauren, I visited your high, your high performing school. And uh, Mr. Kara spent all that time really talking about how important it was to engage. And I don't know if he's, uh, you know, listening maybe on replay, right? But he's, he was so good about, hey, just come and have some tea, right? He was always, he was always just trying to just lean in and because he knew the importance of a parent feeling heard, right? And so you've got to do that as an administrator. You you can't hide in your office. You can't avoid car lines. You can't avoid people. Um, you That is your work. Your work is the people, especially if you're a charter school principal, because they specifically come and choose your school And so I talk about how there's different levels of engagement. So the first level of engagement is that they chose you and that they are driving their kid to school and they are maybe packing a lunch and they are sacrificing some things. But we tend to forget that in, you know, a charter school world. You know, we feel like sometimes we feel like our parents are entitled and all these, you know, and I won't say that they don't act that way sometimes, but I don't think we really help it either. Right. So we have to remember they already do engage because they chose us. Now, what's those next levels of engagement that we could take them to, understanding that 80% of our hours, volunteer or support, are probably going to come from 20% of our population. Uh, so if we understand that, then we can't be so you know disappointed when only a certain amount of people show up for something. Um, right. And that's and that's that's a really important lens that you have to look at as a leader. Uh, it's the lens principle, right? We tend to look at others how uh, how uh, we are, not how they are. And I think a big part of this leadership and this indicator specifically is looking at your school from through the eyes of of your parent body. So yeah, great. I I was just going to add um, now that I have my own child and in the K through 12, you know, world, it it was hard prior to have that lens because you don't truly understand that parent perspective always. Um, But there have been many a times now where I'm like, man, I'd go back and do things differently now that I have this lens myself. Yeah. Um, But that is so important to just try to have that parent lens on and how are things coming across to them? Um, You know, you and I talked earlier today, Tom, about some of the survey data that we've uh, read over the years. And that's part of the feedback is we don't understand the newsletters. They use mm-hmm. all this school lingo that we have no context around. And so if, if we could remember that school lens of, well, does a parent understand the, the specifically, this was about SEL. They didn't know yeah. what, you know, SEL stood for. They were like, they're doing something about SEL, but we're not sure what it means. 
right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Social and emotional. So that parent right? lens. I don't even is, know. It could be it. Yeah. Yeah, social and emotional learning. Yeah. Um, but having that parent lens is so important, and um, and I think that the expectations that you talk about um is is big. You know, when when reflecting on the survey data that I've read. You know, the school expectation is typically, you know, there can be some tangible expectations, but a lot of them are untangible. You know, they want them to read their emails. They want them to um, show up for a parent teacher conference. They want them to make sure their kids are turning homework in time. That's what the, the school wants. Whereas right. the parents are like, they just want me to send in the, the supplies. They want me to make the monetary donations. You know, those are more tangible mm -hmm. things. Um, and so where are the misalignment? How can we make sure that, that there is an alignment and what the parents are thinking the expectation is versus the school? And I can't uh, remember if I wrote about it or not. I think I did in this book where I talked about my uh, daughter's uh, kindergarten experience. The first uh, parent orientation I went to when the whole time it was all about fill out this form. It was nothing about how we were going to educate your kid and keep them safe and make them feel good. And I'm thinking, man, my my kids in kindergarten, like <laughs> when did we become so robotic? You know, mm -hmm. and I was, you know, I wasn't happy, uh, you know, for sure. And I think about those things a lot. You know, like I watch what goes out. I don't put my eyes on every single thing, but, you know, I will go back and look at it. And then, and then if we need to make adjustments, have some conversations, but just kind of remembering, hey, is this is this communication coming from our language or are, are we speaking parent language here? Mm -hmm. And as Maxwell talks about, and it's one of my favorite lessons uh, to teach and everyone communicates few connect, you know, connectors keep it simple. They keep the cookies on the bottom shelf. They make sure people understand what's the actual message, you know, and you and I like, we'll go back and forth. And I know like our team, I'm like, we're really good with hyperlinks and stuff. And I look at him like, is a board member going to be like able to click on those things? And no, and I'm like, oh, Lauren, right. And I'm like, oh, no, we're like, like what? It's just so like, you just have to think about that. Like who, who is my audience? Who am I communicating to? Um, our team just started this like, sport or this uh fitness app as a school and we're all trying to start our challenge and like people are like i can't get in and i'm like oh gosh what would it look like if it were easy jeff gorski always used to say that to me when he was our teammate now uh, now he's a principal at envision tom what would it look like if it were easy so just really think about that everybody like think about engagement think about your volunteering i tell the story about my wife how she like wouldn't okay. volunteer because they said <laughs> Matthew couldn't come like that. It just, it was yeah. like spiteful. And I'm like, man, you're spiteful about that. But we do those things in schools. And I do think that COVID impacted that. And everybody's trying to not go back to normal, but they're definitely realizing there's something missing from their school. So get a copy of the book. If you're listening to this and don't have, have a copy of the book, I really feel like uh, we have a great, there's three or four great uh, you know, almost like a checklist of things that you could do to bring your school together, um, have, make sure that your parents are partners in some aspect of the, of the school improvement process, that you're getting annual feedback. Uh, as you know, Lauren said, we've got a great school climate survey that's had really great uh, results and impact on schools, how they can really understand how their families think about them and feel about them, why they chose them, why they stay there, all that's really critical information. And it helps the school use our school leadership, our, our school leadership made real simple process, you know, REAL, relationships, equipping, attitude and leadership, right? Relationships, everything starts with relationships and trust. If you don't have relationships, there is no trust. There's going to be no progress. Um, equipping, we talk about, you know, uh, um, how, how can you equip your parents to know more? right? To be better. So almost like a parent university. Like, I just think there's some, there's some great things that schools can do to help equip their parents that make the parents feel more confident. Like Lauren said, teach them how to understand the acronyms <laughs> or don't use them, 
right? Give them a, a sheet that says, hey, here's our, here's our acronym. Sorry for our like acronym language, everybody. This is how we speak. This is education ease or whatever. Uh, and here's your, and here's your, you know, cheat sheet. But I mean, there's so many things you could do to help, you know, parents be better uh, parents and be better partners for your school. Um, and I think, you know, the attitude piece, that core values part is so important, but really understanding that everybody's doing their best. Everybody, every parent that, you know, everybody's got that parent that's late, like 90% of the time, right? And all we do is judge that parent. But we have no idea what it's like to be that parent. We've all been late before, but we don't know what the heck's going on at home. Maybe that, you know, maybe that mom or dad are working multiple jobs to keep it going or, you know, I mean, whatever the situation, we don't know. And then L, leadership, create that environment to do so, right? So make sure that you're really looking everything through that lens. You know, I tell the story about my wife, like th there are, there were ways to engage my wife to help. She wanted to help, but leadership like didn't see that. They didn't see the barriers that they were creating, um, you know, for it. So do we think, do we take the time to think about and highlight the sacrifice that a lot of our parents make? If we thought about it from that lens, could we raise engagement? Right. And, you know, whatever that looks like at our school. Right. It's more than just making sure kids get to school, come in uniform. A clean uniform is awesome. Have their lunch. You know, do their homework, check their bag once a week. I don't know. I mean, what is your what's your bottom line? What is it? <laughs> and then and then help them be able to accomplish that on a daily basis because they want to be they want to be part of the school. In my opinion. That's how I'm going to look at them. They all want to be here, right? They all want to be here. And then, yeah, that, yeah go oh, ahead. Sorry, go. I was just say that was one of my reflection um, questions I had written out was just what are the potential barriers that, again, going back to that parent lens, but just identifying what are some of the, the potential barriers? Is it your policies? You know, that that's what your story for your about your wife's experience or is it your policy policies you have in place is it just unclear expectations you know i know um you know instead of having one of my daughter's schools you know the parents are expected to help with lunch coverage mm. but the, i realized that the parents didn't um because i was in in charge of trying to get them to come in and, and volunteer and then i realized they didn't know what to do though and so i'm like okay what if i educate them like from this time to this time, you're going to do this. And then you're going to do this. And because to a parent, they, they're not a classroom teacher. They don't have that background that I have. So I wasn't intimidated to show up and supervise 25 kids. Yep. Um, but for a lot, you know, th that was a barrier. They didn't know what that experience was going to look like. They hadn't gone through it before. Um, and it makes me think about, you know, community school of Davidson, right? They had a really strong orientation for their volunteers and their subs so that the parents felt equipped and that they had the mm -hmm. tools and resources. And maybe most importantly, because their school was established on such great core values, you know, the kids didn't act like super stinkers because that's what kids will do. I mean, they're kids. Yeah. That's what they're going to do. Uh, and it's not that adults <laughs> are any better at times, but, you know, but if your school has strong core values, then then there's going to be this deeper understanding for all human relationship in the building. Um, and there's yeah. going to be this mutual level of respect. And that's really where relationships start, um, you know, with that. But no, I love what you said about, oh, I realize they don't, right? That's all awareness. All this is awareness. And so, you know, at first, when you started to say that, Lauren, I, I thought it was that you were volunteering at your daughter's current school and you were like managing something. I'm like, oh my gosh, what a great oh, I am. Oh, okay, good. Okay. So like if I'm the <laughs> principal, then I want you and whoever else is doing that around the round table, I'm going to buy you lunch and say, hey, what, what have you learned in this experience? Yeah. Because obviously we got to get better at some things, right? So you're untapped information. And if you didn't have the lens of a, of a, of a principal, you wouldn't even know to do that. Probably you would have been like, right nobody's showing up or nobody's doing what I asked them to do. And they just don't know. And you don't know. And you're like, so that's, that's that, that's that uh, Peter principle, right? Everybody's going to get promoted mm -hmm. to incompetent. So luckily you had the skill set uh, to actually like organize and lead uh, people uh, for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So important. 
Yeah. So you hear that principle. It's like whoever is your like lead volunteers, sit them down and say, hey, what's what's going well? What's going wrong? Where can we improve? Right. Uh, there's that six that question. I think it's on page like 107 or something like there's like six like uh, questions mm -hmm. to after that after action review process and really hear uh, from them. And then, you know, I wrote equip your families. Right. Every family should know know at least understand a little bit of the mission, the vision, uh, you know, the purpose, the values, the goals, like, you know, it's not that they're going to be like out there, you know, like just nailing it, but they should have an understanding and, and, and your school has to live those pieces out. So if you go back to, you know, indicator one, if you had low scores in terms of, you know, mission, then you could probably guess that your parents have no idea. Um, about really what your school is about. They're just there because it's a better option. But you can change that. You know, you can change that by communicating it. And I listed out like nine or 10 ways to be able to, uh, you you know, utilize the parents, which really made me think about Lauren. I was like, oh, this section of the book almost needs to be back up in indicator one. But it's a great, it's a great, uh, there was three or four that I'm like, oh, this is good. I'm going to use this at my school, which is comical, right? Because I'm like, oh. <laughs> One thing I wanted us to touch on, just because I know in our inner circle, um, this has been a big topic, and I know it's something that you've been struggling with at your school too, is the attendance piece. Mm, yep. And um, I thought that all of the kind of bullet points that you listed out in the book of ways to improve your attendance were easy things. Um, that could be implemented that could have a significant impact. Um, you know, I love the part about bringing in the trusted medical professionals. Like, again, it all kind of goes back to identifying yep. the barriers and building those relationships to um, root out what is the, what is the cause here for this attendance issue? Yeah, and I'll and I'll give a shout out to a David Franklin. He he just wrote a great book called Advice from the Principal's Desk, and he has a whole section about that's that's that, that that's the principal's job is to get butts in seats because your because your because your scores won't improve and kids won't learn if they're not there. Uh, so you got to find ways to get kids in in the chairs, uh, and then equip the teachers so that they can reach them. Because if they're not there. And, you know, I do think that we really have, again, like we've moved to this positional leadership where like we're sending letters home and we're just marking kids, you know, truant. I mean, there's a school system around me. I think I saw that like 43 percent of its uh, high school students were in chronic uh, tr tr truancy. And I was like, oh, I mean, uh, how 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 are they surviving uh, with that type of data? Um, but yes, improve the instruction at your school. You all had that teacher and that just happened here. Uh, we had good uh, Friday, we had a half a day. And one of our teachers had this great Easter egg hunt, middle school where the kids were doing math problems when they found the egg. And I just kind of you know, gave her a shout out at the staff meeting and she said, kids came to school to do that today. Cause our school is wow. not always easy to get to. And I'm like, yeah, they came to school because they wanted to engage in this activity. Um, and I tell the story about Shelby, uh, you know, Shelby Gorski, which is, I mean, maybe my first real experience in how how a teacher can really impact a kid's life uh, with that. Um, be up, engage the community, build in the trust of medical. And my wife was one of those. She was the car seat technician. So we would bring her in and during, uh, you know, just a, just an added value. It's just another value add. Um, and then use soap. Make sure you're Make sure you got soap in your bathroom. It just drives me crazy when you go use a bathroom and there's no soap. Like, or they or now now we all have hand sanitizers on the wall, but they're empty. Like, what's the point? <laughs> let's go. Like, like let's go. Like, yeah. that drives you crazy. But you have you have so many ways that you could raise, you know, raise attendance. And of course, there's there's lots of families still out there struggling. And there's lots of families that don't think that school's as important because they they watched their kid, you know, survive in a virtual um, you know, moment and that they don't, they don't, they're not knowledgeable enough to know the gap that, you know, right. So you got to do some home visits you got to take the time to do it and re-engage and, and, um, and, you know, build that, build those influential programs in your school, in your building, uh, to make sure that kids show up every day. Shouldn't be a barrier. Not at all. So. 
Yeah. I love it. So everybody, uh, if you have, is there anything else that we want to talk about for this one? I mean, I got lots of notes, but I just, I just, <laughs> you know, equipping your families. Um, and then, you know, really, John Maxwell talks about this a lot. So it's page, is it page 161? Is that possible? Yeah. Um, at the It's 161 in my book, so it might be close to that. But it's in the section, parents are well-educated on the school's mm -hmm. mission. Leaders who attract followers but never develop leaders, they get tired. Being able to impact only those who you can touch personally is very limiting. In contrast, leaders who develop leaders impact far beyond their personal reach. And this, this just goes back to identifying those volunteers in your school, those parent you know, body, those uh, strategic partners that are willing to do more. And and I do think we've got a lot of principals that are they're just super duper wore out. There's a lot of teachers that are wore out. And it could be, you know, one of these things is like I'm not developing leadership capacity in my in my potential base. Um, it makes me think of Union Day School when no, not Union Day School, Union Academy, uh, when they had like, you know, 50 required hours for volunteering and like two, two thousand kids. I'm like, like that's like a hundred thousand hours. They're like, who wouldn't? Like we pay a volunteer coordinator to do that work, right? And to get all that extra piece and it's done with intentionality and it's done with purpose and there's a lot of celebration. I'm like, yeah, of course. Like there are ways that you can build uh, capacity in people, utilize their strengths and their resources to improve your school. But you but you gotta be, you have to be intentional about it and, um, and make sure that there's a plan because because then there's nothing worse than getting volunteers on your campus and you're not sure what they're going to do because I've done that too I think I wrote it. <laughs> well that's you did write about that okay I thought so oh god well that was that was the worst <laughs> thank you for coming I got nothing for you to do oh <laughs> man man that was well, the last time that they showed up I want to read I want to read a quote out of your book that okay. I loved and underlined before we move on um it says when family engagement gets real educators and families become true allies in educational excellence. Schools foster a sense of belonging for everyone and students succeed in school and beyond. Yeah. Agreed. Did I write that? That was mine? You wrote that. <laughs> it's so Dash true. Tom Miller. <laughs> I, love I love it. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. What's the page number? So uh, folks can go. Find that was page 160. It. Yeah. 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 Right. So it is. It's just so, it's just so important. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, be easy on your parents, everybody. Just like you, they're doing as best that they can, right? And and, yeah. and I think we could all agree if we could kick the person most uh, responsible for our you know our problems, none of us could sit down. So it's okay. Like just check your ego, see what you can get, right? Think big, start small. Don't worry about the people who don't show up. Pour into the volunteers who do, and I guarantee you're going to build an army if you do it correctly. And they're going to really surround your school. Um, and love on your school and love on your kids because that's why you're doing this. Uh, so take that time. All right. So let's so let's let's mark our scores up here. Um, I've got my. I was really harsh on myself on this one. I um. I remember looking at this last night, and I was like, "Well, we can do so much better with Indicator Six. I thought as a school, I feel we have a pretty engaged community. Uh, but we don't really have like the most important pieces, like the written down part. And um, so I think I scored myself like really low here, almost a zero, I think, off the top of my head. Yeah. So I was just I was just, you know, sharing about this. So I've got I've got two out of five, I think, was my original. But when I think about it, um, the ongoing opportunities for the parents to learn about the school's mission, I wouldn't say we're very good there. And the parents as the partners are an integral part of the improvement plan. So this is, those are two that I definitely want to work on. So I gave myself a zero out of five here. Um, I think I'm just. Isn't that interesting? You just said that you, you feel like your parent engagement is so strong yet when you actually looked at the score, yeah. you're at, you gave yourself a zero out of five. I think that's the importance of the, the sub indicators, but it, this really is a growth model. There's always room for growth. Yeah. And Which, when I say that it's poor, I just mean like the like the structure of it. I mean, we've got we got parents, you know, because we got spring breakers. So you can come by our school and you'll find a parent with an orange 
uh you know like like they have surrounded the school to make sure uh spring breakers don't accidentally wander right onto our soccer field and things i mean so they're that's i mean they are highly engaged but i wouldn't say yeah. that if we sat down and talked about these you know it, it, it would be a really good conversation so especially the last one the uh, student attendance agreements like we like we've got them written down but we're not following them right i mean you know we got kids that are so over over their max um, and it's part of who we are. So this is this is one area I talked to my principals about this week. I was like, I want us all to read this chapter, and let's really let's really think through how we can improve uh, little by little because we're really good now. And if we put these things in place, we're going to be skyrocketing to the top. So, so that really takes a big chunk out of my wheel. It's flat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big zero. So you have a flat tire on that side. I have a I have a flat tire in indicator six, which is right next to my culture one, which was high. So I'm just it's like a big gap, big gap. All right. So let's uh, finish up with uh, uh, governance, shall we? So we yeah. move to indicator 10 here. Um, oh, make sure you write down your action step, everybody, what what your action step is going to be. And I think uh, my action step for that one, I said, is going to be um, to make sure that we have ongoing, and this is a perfect time because we've got orientations coming up for, for our, our new families and ongoing opportunities for the parents to learn about the school's mission, vision, and values. Uh, it's a great um, cultural opportunity, which we have, but we don't specifically say, here's our mission, here's our vision, here's where we're going. Um, and then we definitely are going to work on the uh, student attendance agreements. That's a big part of our orientation for our new high school kids, letting them understand like, hey, got to come to school, got to come to school and working with our teachers. All right. For like effective governance, what did I write down? Oh, and I already told you like this, this one here. Um, every, I'll just say this, every, every failed charter school everyone um the 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 cause to that failure can be traced back to the actions or the non-actions of the governing board and it's it's usually because one of two things they're micromanaging the heck out of the school and they got founder syndrome or whatever it may be and they just can't like keep leadership in play or they know there's something wrong but they don't ask any questions about it, right? And and it's always the dreaded Lauren. I think I've said this too before. I was like, oh, I heard the dreaded. They're such a nice person. We love them so much. I'm glad you love them. Are they executing? <laughs> Are they doing a good job? Are they leading this multi-million dollar enterprise? Like, what do we need to, you know, uh, provide them to help them? Because the charter school principal's job is the most interrupted job on the planet. Maybe, maybe a little bit less than like, you know, like an emergency room doctor, because everybody's problem is your problem. And you don't have, you know, a massive administrative team to, you know, typically address uh, challenges. And so in your small charter school or your growing charter school, you might be the uh, you know, you're the head of school, you're, a, you're, a, you know, you're a principal, you might be the nurse some days, you might even be driving a bus, right? You're the finance director, maybe you're, I mean, you're all these things. And you could do all those things. You just, you just can't do it well. It's just impossible, right, to really do it well. So when it comes to effective governance, you know, I always find that you got to, you know, it's, it's more about the people and less about the, you know, the role. And clear roles is critically important. People need to understand what their role is because if they don't have the right values and character, whatever may, they'll find a role. <laughs> and it's typically not one that the head of school wants, you know, wants them in or it causes problems. Um, so you got to get the right, the right people. So it's your job as the head of a charter school and a private school to recruit. Uh, strong, effective board members that are there for the right reasons and bring a specific skill set, a talent, a perspective, a resource to your school that is going to uh, help you achieve those long-term goals. And we see it all the time. 
poor board recruitment leads to a friend zone and sooner or later a quorum of the board are friends and it only takes one to not like a decision that the head of school made and and they're gone it it doesn't take very long after that uh once that you know fractures in place so just two things to really really remember all actions right all actions and actions are not actions all actions by the board impact kids and if we truly have a kid first organization a kid first learning organization then then that should always be your marshmallow right whatever you're trying to get on top kids are on top student learning every every decision we do impacts them uh, and and so can can we always say that right did did we make the best decision for the future of kids at this school and you're making million dollar decisions every board meeting and you're having million dollar discussions so if you're like coming to the board as like a social experiment please 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 resign <laughs> because your heads of schools work their tails off uh, and and they really need strategic partners when it comes to these you know decisions. And you got charter school renewal, right? The board members need to be prepared for um, annual auditing, uh, policy development, um, uh, really strategic financial decisions that can get the school in a really bad spot. Um, but they also need to be trust, um, you know, trust but verify, right? So they need to make sure that they understand. The reports back to Lauren's keep, you know, kind of keep it simple conversation. Like you need someone on your board who understands this information that is being presented by the head of school. Uh, and if the head of school is uh, providing information that no one understands, um, that's a problem. Because you don't know what if it's actually around, right? Um, so uh, just remember, you're making million dollar decisions. You're having million dollar discussions. Uh, on page 288, I think if everybody started here and just said, okay, like here's the four keys, four key strategies to build trust and relationships between board and leadership. Number one, you got to have a common vision and, and committed to goals, right? Where are we going and what are the goals we're aiming to achieve? And every goal in some way should be about a better place for kids, right? Uh, set clear expectations. And this this is... What I mean by this is like, you know, every month, just talk about from a board leadership perspective, what do I want, you know, from a board, like, what do, what, what do we want more of in terms of reporting and what do we want less of, right? Uh, or, or like, a you know, should, you know, when do you want to be communicated to when there's emergency on campus? Like, just, you're just constantly um, you know, creating those guardrails. So everybody knows, right? Everybody knows. And so if I'm ahead of school and I report to my board chair, I expected the board chair is going to tell tell the rest of the board, but I stopped assuming, Lauren, because you know what assumptions do. And so after I tell him, then I say, "Do you want me to tell the rest of the board, or are you going to do it, or do you, or do you, do you think the rest of the board needs to know this?" Because what happens, right, is the board members hear stuff in the community. And then someone's like, aren't you on that board? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, well, let me tell you what happened. And you're like, oh, I didn't know that was happening. And that's a problem, right? No one no one likes to be uh, you know, caught off guard. So communicate to your board, right? Like they're going to the party of the year, right? You just, just keep them keep them in the light, uh, not, not in the dark. Grow together. Uh, so you should always be doing annual retreats and participating in board training, maybe even a book study. Uh, in the book, there's a month by month board, you know, uh, professional development plan here for you that you can easily just use. It's a piece of cake and it'll really keep your, your board healthy. Um, and then leave. The last one is uh, leave your emotions at the door. And so um, I know it's really hard, but if you're a board member, but also a parent, you're at that seat as a board member, not as a not as a parent, um, and you 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 need to be curious, not uh, critical, uh, when it comes to just understanding uh, where you know where uh, we are. So it's such a, such an important spot, and it's a constant building relationship. It never ends because you know data shows that the the average tenure 
for a, a principal is less than three years. And so if the board, if the principal is changing every three years and the board members are changing every three years, you're slowly drifting away uh, from why your school even um, even existed. And, and so that's a, that's a big issue. So million dollar decisions, you got to build relationships. And the last note I wrote for myself, Lauren, is ineffective time together. Oh, nothing worse than an ineffective board meeting. Just seven people sitting around talking about nothing important. No offense to board members, but your meetings need to be purposeful and intentional and, and driven by decisions. And all the work should be done in committees that work in between the board meetings is so, so important. And your committee should, should do all the, all the really the deep dives and, and handle all those things. I mean, if you're having board meetings that are like two and a half and three hours, like it's, you're a very unhealthy uh, board. And I'm sorry to tell you that uh, your time can be used a lot better. And, and, and there's lots of, there's a couple strategies here in the book that are definitely going to help you uh, do that. But Lauren, I took, I took all the, it took all the thunder out, but this one, this one, this, you know, chapter itself is, is really its own book. I mean. Yeah. Well, I think you, you summarized it really well. The only other things that I had underlined that I thought were key to maybe talk about was just um, those two E words, executing and ensuring. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And thank you, Brian Carpenter, for that. I mean, Brian Carpenter, he's a great governance expert. When I think about my board experience, I mean, I I didn't, I was a charter school principal. Did you, well, you probably had, like, it, when you were a teacher, like, you know, did you know that the board existed as a charter school? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, even when I was a middle school director, I was not the head of the school. So I only went to like one or two board meetings, probably because they don't want me there because I was such a loud mouth. But I really didn't understand, you, you know, uh, governance. And then when I got to the Office of Charter Schools in North Carolina, like I, they're like, oh, you're the governance trainer for the state. I'm like, oh, fantastic. What the heck does a board do? But I read everything. Brian Carpenter, Marcy Cornell Feist, you know, uh, Dr. Jim Gunner, they're all huge resources. Um uh, Carver is another one. Like there's really great, you know, governance experts. So this book is a combination of all that. But to your point, like ensuring and executing, that's the board's job. How well is the education plan meeting the needs of our kids? How well are the policies creating the culture we desire to see, right? How well is, is the finance uh, plan keeping us viable? I mean, like, this book is is your measuring tool and you could just use the measuring uh, you know the wheel of success measuring tool as your tool and say okay here's here's our goal we could write a goal per indicator right or even a you know objectives per sub indicator that here's where where we want to get to and then the leadership team creates a plan to improve that part of their wheel and the board is it how well right how well is our marketing plan, right? You know, bringing in the students, how well is our recruiting and orientation? Like all those pieces work here. So anytime you're a board member and you find yourself, you know, talking about how will, because that's the leadership team's responsibility. Management talks about how will, um, then you know that you're down the wrong, you know, uh, you know, the wrong path. It's, it's not, it's not really your job. Um, yeah. Ensuring and executing at two E's. And then I, I love the other resource too. I mean, we talked about the the time that a board, but you know, the age of the board really, you know, determines how the board meeting should be spent. If a board, if a school is more than five years old, I mean, they really shouldn't be talking about too much in the present. Everything should be about the future. It's the board's job to cast vision to the future, right? And and so if like you know, maybe only 20, I can't remember the exact data points, but there's a table in the book, maybe 20 or 30% of your meeting is about the present and 70% is about the future. And, and, and if you got a school that's 10, 10 years older, it's even less, right? I mean, cause really it's like, here's my board report. It's based upon our school's goals. I have three action items, right? We've got our executive director template. So if you're part of our book study, uh, you have access to that. 
Um, but here's here's the goals. Here's what we know are the key indicators of our school. You've got the report. It's in your hands seven days, you know, five to seven days in advance. What questions do you have? None. Great. I'm good as <laughs> I'm good as I'm just here to answer, you know, questions. Now, if the principal of the school is is uh, doing the majority of the, of the talking during the board meeting, that's a problem. That's a significant problem. Um, and so, so, you know, you have to recruit board members that are going to be engaged, going back to the engagement piece, having clear roles and responsibilities and engagement agreement. This is what we need from you. Eight meetings a year, show up on time, be prepared, lead a committee, right? Have us in your top, top three of your tithing. I mean, whatever your expectations might be and you communicate them and then you execute them. Uh, every single year. And the most important plan that a board can have is a succession plan, which I wrote about a lot in the book about how if boards don't build in succession plans, all that great historical knowledge, decision making is just going to fly away um, because of that turnover. And our school's making some significant financial, you know, decisions. And I was just like, we should have our income. We've already voted in our new board members for next year, but I think they should be at these next two or three meetings because they need to hear the discussion. Uh, so they'll be great. They'll be great when they start. Um, so having good orientation plan and succession plan are both critically important uh, from a board uh, standpoint. So what's your action step for uh, governance? Um, I think I was much nicer to myself on this one uh, when, I, <laughs> when I scored. Um, and I think our board does a really, really great job of, of um, they're very, they're very engaged. And in fact, sometimes too engaged. They, they, they just really, they really spend a lot of time and we've done a good job recruiting talent uh, to our board in lots of different areas. So if you don't have a board recruitment tool, uh, we've got one for you. Uh, and if you're part of the book study, um, it's in your it's in your drive. But having every year you should be doing a skill set inventory of your board and um, looking at the terms and who's going to roll off and what as a, you know a skill set. So if you're in the first year of your board term, you should already be thinking about who's going to replace me. And what are the skill sets that I bring? So if I can basically recruit myself, then that puts the board in a good spot. But the other area of board recruitment is around your strategic goals. So your vision drive your goals and that drives your board recruitment. So if I need to raise $10 million, I should have board members that either uh, have either raised $10 million so they can be our mentors in there, right? Uh, or that can um, know uh, people who will donate uh, money. If if I've got a goal to expand, then I should have you know board members that understand uh, commercial property and and all those great things and major projects. Like so, your your long term vision recruits your um, second half of your board. The other half of your board is your finance, your governance, your education. Um, you know, plan for that. So having an intentional board recruitment plan is important. And I gave myself, I gave our school a nine out of nine in this one. I, I there's nine, right? Three, six. Yep, yeah, three. there's nine. Yeah, I think we had a perfect score for indicator 10. Yeah, and so it's important. And 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 uh, the health of your board will determine the success of your, of your school, for sure. And I remember in my, in my times as a board chair, uh, and you know, all every time I left, I just asked myself, "What will the board chair ten years from now think about the decisions that we made today? Did we put the school in a better spot, or did we make it worse uh, for them?" So that's what that's what board members should be thinking about: um, succession, right? And then looking forward, uh, how do we make sure that we keep this great this great path to success moving? Any other feedback, Lauren? When are you going to be a board member? You're next. We're going to get you on a board. <laughs> I don't know. My my thoughts are now, you know, we've gone through all two, 10 indicators. I've got my wheel completely filled out. I have an understanding of 
where our strengths and weaknesses are, what's next? Now, what, what would be a good next step if I was a school leader? Yeah, I love it. Thanks for uh, reminding me because uh, I got to fill in my wheel here. All right. So I've got my wheel. And if I've been having week by week conversations around this, right? And then so so what I should be doing is, you know, prioritizing what areas of mm -hmm. so here's my here's my wheel. And so I should be prioritizing uh okay, what 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 change is going to make the greatest impact on our school's, you know, success? What minor tweak? And so for for me, like I'm specifically looking at indicators uh, three and four. These tend to be the lowest two of of most most wheels that we that we evaluate. Um, and so, an indicators uh, three is really focused on looking at the student work through the data you know driven culture. So maybe I have someone in particular on my team that this is their uh, strength. So we may identify one sub indicator, and then we're going to use our skinny strategic plan tool or a template to work through, you know, what are the action steps? Because I don't need to know all the action steps. I just need to know what are, you know, what does the next 30 days look like? How can I start to improve that piece? And then indicator four is really uh, focused on equipping and, you know, developing a people and recruitment. So I, hopefully there's another person that can help with that. So I might be like assigning members of my team, you know, uh, specific indicators based upon, their job, right? I've got my finance uh, and my operations might be one uh, person, uh, you know, whatever that may be. So I've, so I've taken the assessment, we've uh, sat down and I'm using my, my uh, template to look at those next steps because we talked about, and next week uh, we're going to do a, a special session uh, and we're going to evaluate um, if, if we're not evaluating our school, what are the risks and so what, 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 what we'll talk a little bit about is that gap, that gap between where we are and where we aim to be and what is causing that gap. What is causing that uh, gap? Is it a skill problem? Is it a resource problem? And, and how do we work towards those pieces? So that's how I'm personally using it, Lauren. Um, is yeah, I, I think is that's I, great. Yeah. Because I'm having um, you know, my team read uh, you know, chapters of the book and say, okay, like we know uh, this, you know, parent engagement is, is a challenge for us. Um, even though we, we got tons of volunteers and a lot of people who say, yes, I don't necessarily know that everybody is here because of our mission and our vision and what we're trying to achieve. I think a lot of people come because we're the best school in the area. And um, that was proven to me as we had a parent say, <laughs> Uh, I need 24 hours to come and tour the school to accept my spot. We're like, nope, <laughs> there's 200 people on the wait list. We're not, uh, you don't have 24 hours. Uh, we already did all yeah. our, you know, tours, right? So so you want to make sure that everybody's there for the right reason and do those pieces. So that, so those, those would be my next steps. And I think if, if someone tries to tackle this wheel by themselves, they're going to, they're going to burn out. So mm -hmm. I definitely don't want you to do that. Um, I want you to to look at where your skill set lies and 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 if as best as possible, um, put uh, people in charge of certain indicators. There's 10 total. Nine of them are management related, really maybe even eight. You could put the mission and the governance you know together and maybe have your board take that part. Um, that you got eight more. So that's maybe four or five uh, people that you could start to assign certain indicators to start working on these pieces. And at minimum, just manage them. Just manage the, the uh, uh, skinny strategic plan that you're going to put in play. How would you use it if you were if you were ahead of school right now? I, I think I would want to go through it like kind of what you're doing, do a book study with my team. Mm -hmm. And I loved your idea around, um, I think I can tend to see something and be like, we've got to just tackle it all, but we, we know that's not going to work. You can't teach the feedback we get from our teachers in or it's too much. Like, can we just do one thing at a time? We're going too fast. And so I love the idea of prioritizing, you know, what's going to make the biggest impact. 
Um, and then, you know, just riding on the wheel. Okay. Who, who, who can be over indicator two, who can be over indicator three on my team and thinking beyond just that, you know, traditional leadership team, who, um, are your teacher leaders that can support you in these areas? You know, depending on your school size, maybe you are a very small admin team. So thinking about who you can empower and delegate. Cause I know again, from our, our, our surveys, teachers want growth opportunities and they are looking for leadership opportunities. And that always isn't um, a title. It doesn't have to be an assistant principal title title. Yeah. This would be yep. a great leadership opportunity for a staff member. Solid point. So, so you made me rethink what I would do. So okay. uh, <laughs> you're, so it's, so it's April 1st. 2024. So I'm looking at this as a June 2025 kind of like, that's my end point. And I'm going to be thinking okay. about my school in 90 day chunks. Okay, so I've got five, I've got five 90 day chunks from now until that point. And I'm thinking about, okay, how can I stretch my wheel as much as possible in in five 90 day chunks. So the first thing I might do is I might challenge my finance uh, director, depending upon how good they are. It might be your job as the head of school to find me some cash. I need some cash because I'm gonna do two things. One, I got some people on staff that I'm gonna give a stipend to, to help me with this work, or I'm gonna hire some you know, you know, know, consultants or some short-term you know, support who might be able to like, infuse and accelerate some of this work um so that might be my first piece so if i prioritize where what like indicators i want to work on then i'm going to look for money to be able to put some money um, towards that indicator especially if i'm thinking about indicators three and four because three and four are really focused on improving uh school health from an academic and um operational uh, standpoint. And I know that the number one way to improve my school's results is to invest in the people that are already here. That's, that, that is going to make a difference uh, for me. And, you know, the other thing I would consider, because we've taken the working genius, we've taken the EQ assessments, we've taken the DISC assessments, right? So we know how we both work in a sense, right? I know you're always trying to figure me out, but I was like, you know, but you're, you're a very like, Hey, like, you know, start to finish. And I'm like, nah, bigger picture. Right. Mm -hmm. Or a big step, but you want to make sure on your team that you have a team that completes each other. So that's maybe something else I'm doing is I'm finding a way to evaluate my team's, you know, strengths. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm also evaluating any areas of growth because if I got someone who's got a weakness or an area of growth in an area that they're in charge of, I uh, I may need to re release them from their weaknesses, not you know uh, release them from employment, right? I'm not saying do that, but take some things away that you know that are you know getting in the way of uh, better results. Um, so that would be another important uh, strategy I would use. That's really that whole indicator for like you're really looking at your team. You're making sure that they're all clear in their their roles and responsibilities. I call it their role to the goal, um, and and that they're trained and equipped to do that you know specific skill that you need as at an eighty percent level. Uh, if they're less than eighty percent, then yes, then you may need to maybe they're just in the wrong the wrong uh, position. But if they're at, you know as eighty percent as good as you can. Um, then start to start to work on, you know, growing them uh, to be better. Yep. Yep. So find some cash. Don't borrow money, though. Don't borrow money. That's bad. Borrowing money is bad. <laughs> what, did, what did we learn? Um, the date book and the checkbook. That's right. Is yeah. Where you should see things that you prioritize. So yeah. this should be that. a priority. So we should see it in your your date yeah, book and your checkbook. And I think you said during that mentoring call that, you know, honestly, each one of these indicators should be on your calendar, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you as the head of school, right, once you've established a vision for what success will look like, 
and you've communicated that uh, vision, you should be, you know, always evaluating your mission. You should be doing walkthroughs to make sure education plan is hidden. You should be, you know, developing your team to make sure they could oversee, uh, you know, the work and that they're, you know, leading those pieces. You should be out front in car line. You should be talking to parents, right? You should be setting up coffees with the principal. I mean, all these things should be uh, on your calendar. You could just call them indicator one time. <laughs> we know Ted's going to do that. Ted, if you're listening, we know you're going to like next week, you're going to show us how you've got it on the calendar. So yeah. So your date book and your checkbook uh, that will certainly demonstrate what you value most. So thanks everybody for being part of the study. And if you're like on this call and you're like, what the heck are they even talking about? Go, go to Amazon and get the book, The 10 Indicators of High High Performing Charter Schools. And it doesn't matter. I have even have a business owner that's reading this book. I mean, because it really, even if you own a business, it's it's eight of the 10 line up. Um, go, to, go, go to Amazon, get the book, 10 Indicators of High Performing Charter Schools. Uh, you can also go to 10indicators.com. And you could buy the book there. And but after you buy the book, no matter what, go to 10indicators.com and, and download all the resources because we have templates uh, for all these indicators that will help you. And you can get access uh, to those as a bonus for uh, buying the book uh, and look in the show notes because there's going to be an opportunity for you to register uh, to our upcoming training on the risks of not evaluating your school and how you could start to build a uh, strategic plan um, to improve all aspects of, of your school. What Lauren was kind of talking about next steps, uh, we'll go deeper with that. So thanks, Lauren, for hanging with me for these uh, five weeks. And thanks, everybody who's been listening. Um, go get the book. And if you've got the book, and you know this is great, Lauren, at the time of this training, we have five ratings on Amazon, all five star. So great job. Uh, so awesome. if you have the book, please take the time to uh, leave us a rating. Uh, and also, uh, so my son thinks I'm cool. If you're listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube, make sure you uh, subscribe because he's always, he's always giving me a hard time about my lack of subscribers. Uh, so either like, share, subscribe and comment and let us know what you would like us to host a podcast because we're moving the format of the podcast. We're going to be really focused on high, high performing principles and interviewing principles and talking more about these indicators and how you can improve your school. So make sure you want to, you want to get the next episode as soon as it drops. That's what the, that's, that's what the kids say, Lauren, as soon as it drops, <laughs> whatever that means. I'm not sure. But anyway, all right. Love you all, everybody. Bye-bye.